I'd like to take this opportunity to look at the different types of dryers. Not all drying tasks are the same, and not all materials behave in the same manner when they're being dried. So different types of dryers or dryer designs are required for different tasks. We'll now look at several different types of dryers used in the food industry. First, let's take a look at the methods of heat delivery. Dryers can be divided into two groups based on the methods in which heat is delivered to the material being dried. There are also ways of removing moisture without the application of heat, and they will be covered at the end of this presentation. With direct application of heat, the material is usually dried directly over the heat source. Drying material over a fire is probably the best example. With indirect application of heat, the material is dried using air that has been previously heated by contact with the heat source. A hair dryer is a good example of this. The air is heated by passing it through a series of heating coils before it is blown on your hair to dry it. Most dryers use the indirect heating method. The indirect application of heat offers better control over the drying process than can be achieved with direct heating, and the following can be controlled. The temperature of the air, the velocity of the air, and the direction in which the air is traveling. Other factors such as humidity may be controlled in some cases. Another method of classifying dryers is by the manner in which they function. Batch dryers are used to process individual batches of material which are placed in the dryer and stay there until they reach the desired final moisture and are removed. Continuous dryers work with raw materials being fed into one end of the dryer on a continuous basis. Dried product comes out the other end on a continuous basis as well. This requires the use of some means of conveying the material through the dryer. Continuous dryers are used in large-scale drying operations. They are generally costly and require a large facility to house them, plus a crew of operators to run them. Batch dryers are used in small-scale drying operations or for specialized applications. No generalizations can be made as to their cost and complexity. For most of our drying operations, batch drying is the more appropriate mode of operation. Now let's take a look at continuous dryers. For solid materials, the material is fed onto a wire mesh conveyor belt that moves the material through the drying chamber and discharges it at the other end. For slurries or solutions, material is pumped into the drying chamber through a spray nozzle assembly into hot air and is separated from the hot air stream that conveys it. For now we will focus on the continuous through circulation dryer. We will use a series of diagrams to explain their operation. A full description is available online in an ebook titled An Introduction to the Dehydration and Drying of Fruits and Vegetables. Here you see the basic design of a continuous through circulation dryer. Wet material is fed onto a conveyor belt at the left side of the diagram. It is then passed through the drying chamber where heated air removes the moisture. The dry material then is discharged from the conveyor belt at the right hand side of the diagram. Multiple zone dryers work in the same way, however they have air flow in different directions. In the first zone the air is going in an upwards direction, in the second zone the air is traveling downwards, in the third zone the air is traveling upwards as well. So this gives us three zones of heated air, an updraft, a downdraft, and the third zone is also an updraft zone. The fourth zone is a cooling zone to reduce the temperature of the heated product before it is discharged into the ambient air. The multiple zone dryer allows us to change conditions in each one of the zones. In the first zone, 
where the material is at its wettest, you can use a slightly higher temperature than you can in zones two and three. In zone one, the bed is dried from the bottom up so that it will not get mashed into the conveyor belt, which would be the case if the air was traveling downwards in zone one. Once the bottom has been dried partially, then the material will pass into the second zone and the downdraft direction will dry the top of it. The third zone could be an updraft or a downdraft depending upon the needs of the material. Air distribution is an important factor. Every effort must be taken to create an even distribution of air over the entire area of the material being dried. Uneven distribution of air creates a lack of uniformity in the moisture of the dried product which is leaving the dryer. Air distribution plates create uniform distribution of air as their name implies. Without them, airflow patterns are chaotic. Positioning of the distribution plates is quite important. Here we see the positioning of the air distribution plates in an updraft zone. When the air enters the drying chamber below the product bed, it would tend to be in a chaotic flow pattern, but by placing large metal plates with small holes drilled in them, you can even out the airflow. Because there is a back pressure on the air distribution plate, each one of the small holes acts as a nozzle and creates a uniform distribution of air as it is directed upwards through the product bed. In a downdraft zone, the same reasoning applies. However, the air distribution plate is placed above the product, so once again there is a back pressure that creates a nozzle effect for each one of the holes in the air distribution plate. And in this diagram, I've actually shown two air distribution plates to even out the airflow even more than when using a single distribution plate. There are many other operational features of continuous through circulation dryers, or conveyor belt dryers as they are often called. We will not go into them here. Let's take a look then at tunnel dryers. These are really a semi-continuous type of dryer. Material is placed on trays or screens or racks, which are then slid into carts. The carts are pulled through a long drying tunnel where heated air blows across the product. Here you see a schematic diagram of a tunnel dryer. The door for the entry of the carts is at the left-hand side of the diagram. The carts containing the trays of material are pulled through the dryer in much the same manner as cars passing through an automated car wash. And we see that the airflow is directed in the opposite direction to, the, to which the carts are traveling. Once the carts reach the end of the dryer, the door for the exit of the carts will open and the carts are pulled out and they are then unstacked and restacked again for future use. Cabinet dryers are one of the most popular types of dryer. The essential design involves placing the material to be dried inside a closed chamber and blowing heated air across it. There are numerous control features which allow for air recirculation, etc. Here is a schematic diagram with a number of features indicated and you can see the legend in the next slide. Fresh air is taken into the dryer at point number one in the bottom left hand corner. There is a baffle there or a valve arrangement to control the amount of air taken into the dryer. The air then passes across heating coils where it is warmed up and all of the motion is provided by the fan at position number four. The heating elements in this case are on the suction side of the fan. The heated air is then blown upwards into the actual drying chamber and in order to direct the air around this bend we have a series of baffles or louvers. Then we have at point number six air distribution plates which act to even out the flow of the air as the air passes over the trays of wet material at location number seven. 
The air now is moist and can be exhausted. However, there may be enough heat and enough drying capacity left so that some of the air can be recirculated and energy efficiencies can be realized. So the arrangement then is to recirculate some of the air in some cases at point number nine and to add makeup air through the fresh air intake and balance this with the valve at point number eight where the exhaust is vented to the atmosphere. And here we have a list of the features from the previous diagram. Tray dryers are the most appropriate type of dryer for most of us to use. You may think of this as a simplification of the cabinet dryer design with very few fundamental differences. There can be numerous variations in the design of tray dryers. Here we see a basic tray dryer design. Heated air enters through an inlet at the bottom left-hand corner of the figure. The slotted air distributors ensure uniform air distribution across the three trays of material being dried. The air then exits through the exhaust stack or the exhaust port at the opposite end of the dryer. Nesco dryers are based on these principles and these are ideal for doing food dehydration at home. The fan and the heating assembly are located in the upper portion of the Nesco dryer, which is gray in this photograph. The material to be dried is placed on plastic trays shown in the right-hand figure. There are four trays in this stack, but the Nesco dryers offer the ability to increase the number of trays that you are operating. This figure shows the airflow pattern in the Nesco dryer and is the diagram that is on the box that the dryer comes in. What we see here is that the heated air travels down the sides of the dryer and then through a louvered arrangement is directed across the surface of the material to be dried on each of these trays and then some of the air is directed back upwards where it is recirculated with fresh makeup air taken in from the outside and other air is exhausted through an outlet at the bottom left hand corner of the diagram. Excalibur dryers are quite popular for home food dehydration and have the same basic design as most other dryers. In this case the dryer in the photograph has nine square trays which slide into the cabinet. The air is heated via heating elements in the back and a fan directs the airflow across the trays and out the door arrangement at the front of the uh, dryer. The door has been removed in this case so you can see the nine trays inside the dryer. Fluidized bed dryers are quite interesting. In these dryers hot air is blown up through the material to lift it and keep the particles suspended in the drying air. This permits good contact between the drying air and the particles. It also prevents the particles from sticking together as they dry. A coffee bean roaster uses this principle as it roasts and dries the beans. And here we see an empty coffee bean roaster. Then we will place some green coffee beans in the roaster with no airflow and you can see that they're resting on the bottom of the drying chamber. When hot air is flowing, the beans are lifted by the air to form a fluidized bed that is continuously moving around in the moving air as they dry and roast. For vibrating bed dryers, the bed of this continuous dryer is mounted on oscillating devices which make the bed bounce up and down. Air comes into the dryer through the bottom of the bed. The material is tossed upwards and pitched forward in the dryer. Here's a rough schematic diagram of how it works and you can see the mechanism in the bottom to vibrate the dryer bed. The product feed is at the left side of the diagram and the product is thrown up into the drying air and moves along through the dryer and is discharged at the right hand side. There are also air distribution plates to ensure a uniform distribution 
of the heated air from the bottom of the dryer. The exhaust air leaves through the stack at the top of the chamber. Spray dryers allow particles in solution to be dried and to form powders. These are very useful for spray dried powders in the dairy industry as well as in the pharmaceutical industry. The liquid is sprayed through an atomizing nozzle to create small droplets. The small droplets then enter a chamber where hot air is flowing. As the droplets fall, they lose moisture and form a powder. The powder is then collected. Here is a schematic diagram of a spray dryer. The liquid feed is shown entering from the top left, goes through an atomizing nozzle, and the spray then travels downwards as liquid droplets that are falling in the dryer. The heated air traveling upwards in the dryer removes the moisture and the particles fall to the bottom. There are many design variations on this and they are a real workhorse in the pharmaceutical and dairy industry. Drum dryers have two counter-rotating drums which pinch the material which then sticks to the heated surface or surfaces if both drums are heated. A doctor blade scrapes the dried material off the heated drum or heated drums as the case might be. One or both drums may be heated as I have indicated. They are used to produce dried potato flakes and other similar products. Here we see a diagram of a drum dryer where wet feed is being introduced into the nip between two counter-rotating heated drums. The material then sticks to the drum surface and moisture is removed. In order to remove the dried material, a doctor blade scrapes it from the drum surface and it falls into a product collection hopper. Other types of dryers include freeze dryers, flash dryers, plate dryers, rotary dryers, vacuum dryers, rotolouver dryers, and solar dryers. Solar dryers are an interesting case in themselves. They are popular in light of rising energy costs. They use heat from the sun to warm air, which then flows across the surface of the food being dried. They are highly dependent upon weather conditions and may take excessively long time to dry products. Solar dryers can be used as a first step in drying when combined with another dryer as a second step. The solar dryer will remove moisture from the surface early in the drying process which is more rapid than moisture removal later on. You should always use caution in solar drying products. It may take several days to dry products with a solar dryer. During this time, microorganisms may actually proliferate. This is especially important with foods for human consumption. Here is a solar dryer which I made and set up in our backyard. The black device in the front is the heat collector and you will notice an opening at the bottom right hand corner of the photograph where air enters the heat collector and the black surface of the sheet metal warms this air which then by natural flow goes into the drying chamber where you see slices of mangoes. Now I've put two solar powered fans on the front at the top of this dryer that look rather like eyes and these then draw the air through the chamber and out to create an even better air flow than would occur naturally. I've also put a small circulating fan inside the dryer to move the air around the drying chamber. It too is solar powered and you just can't see it because it's sitting in the back of the dryer and it's black and in the shadow. The balance at the top is linked into the rack where the mangoes are being held so that I can monitor the weight of the mangoes during the drying process. By having the dryer mounted on a turntable device I can keep it pointed into the sun as the sun travels across the sky during the drying period. Here's a more sophisticated dryer. It's called the SolarFlex dryer 
and it's manufactured by a company called Malnutrition Matters. And I've been fortunate to be doing some volunteer work with this company over the past few years. This dryer works on the same principles, but it has some computer fans inside which are powered via a 12 volt battery and a solar panel. So the air is drawn in from the top right into this glass chamber which heats the air as it travels from right to left across the photograph. There is then a plenum or a, a tube device which then introduces the air into the large black box where the fans are situated. The air is sucked into the box, travels through the fan area, and then is blown across numerous racks where the product is held. The outlet for the exhaust air is at the bottom right of the drying chamber. And I've also mounted this on a turntable so I can keep it directed towards the sun during the drying period. Osmotic dehydration is another interesting process. Moisture can be removed by the forces of osmotic pressure, drawing that moisture out of the tissues of the fruit or vegetables. It is often done using sugar or salt. Sugar can be in the form of a concentrated sugar solution, which is 50 to 60 percent by weight. Solutions may be heated to about 50 degrees Celsius to speed the process, and this is different than using hot air to evaporate moisture. Heating speeds the diffusion of moisture in this case. Here we see some cranberries in a sucrose solution. It can also be done using crystalline sugar or salt. This technique has been used for many years to dry fish. Here we will use carrots instead of fish. So the carrots are placed into a plastic tray and they can then be covered with salt. The salt then draws the moisture from the carrot tissues via an osmotic pressure mechanism, which we will not describe in any great detail here. So in the top left photograph, the carrots are buried in salt. Then in the bottom right, I have uncovered them to show how the moisture has gone into the salt and the salt is caking. The carrots are also rather limp or flaccid in this case. Salt is taken into the plant tissue during this process. The material may need to be soaked before using it to reduce the salt content as is the case with salted fish. Salt intake is an important dietary consideration so please think carefully about this. Crystalline sugar, which we call table sugar or sucrose, has some interesting applications in osmotic dehydration. We saw cranberries in a concentrated sugar solution in a previous slide. This approach here avoids the use of a solution. We will use examples of apples and mangoes. For apples, we're going to place several slices of apples, which we have previously weighed, in a sealable container. You don't have to weigh them, but in the case of a scientific experiment, we always do this. And this works even if the slices are overlapping slightly. So we've got the fresh apple slices in a container. We then weigh some sugar crystals in a container so that the weight is about 50 to 100 percent of the weight of the apple slices. We're going to spread the sugar crystals evenly over the apple slices and seal the container. Here we see the sugar crystals on the apple slices. We're going to set the container aside for 12 to 24 hours and then we're going to take a peek at what has happened. This can be done at room temperature quite effectively. So after 24 hours of exposure to the sugar, you no longer see the white sugar crystals on top of the pieces of apple, but instead you see that the moisture that has been drawn out of the apple slice tissue has created a syrup a very thick sugar syrup. And you can note the sugar syrup which has been formed. For mangoes, we're going to repeat the same process that we used for the apple slices. The mango slices are now in the container with sugar sprinkled on top of them. After 24 hours exposure to the sugar, 
we can certainly see the syrup which has been formed. The partially dried apple slices or mango slices can then be drained or rinsed and blotted dry. They can then be dried in a conventional tray, forced air dryer, to get the desired final moisture content. You cannot get down to the final moisture content entirely using osmotic dehydration. There may also be an uptake of some of the sugar which sweetens the final product. These dried mango slices were probably dehydrated osmotically and then dried in a forced air dryer. These were supplied by Bulk Barn and contain about 66% sugar. A dusting of sugar adds to the sweetness and prevents them from sticking together. These mango slices are from President's Choice, which is a national grocery store brand in Canada. They contain about 69% sugar by weight. Thank you very much.